Today at the National Press Club, Natasha Stott Despoyer. The former senator heads the group Our Watch, established to prevent violence against women and children. But it's alarmed the COVID pandemic is making the problem worse. Natasha Stott Despoyer with today's National Press Club address. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Press Club of Australia and today's Westpac address. My name is Sabra Lane. I'm the club's president. I'm also the presenter of the ABC radio program AM. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce today's guest, Natasha Stott Despoyer, who is the chair of Our Watch, a national leader in primary prevention uh, in um, stopping violence against women and children. I also want to point out that last year, Natasha wrote this essay on violence all proceeds from the sale of this book do go to Our Watch and it is still available at all good bookstores. Sadly, I do want to note that six months ago today, Hannah Clark and her three children were brutally murdered in Queensland and that prompted an amazing outpouring of grief and shock right around the nation. I want to remember her and those three kids today, which leads me to this point. Here and probably at home, you're going to hear a lot of information and statistics today that might be distressing and it might be a little bit overwhelming. If that's you, especially if you're in an abusive situation, I think that you can also reach out to 1800RESPECT uh, and that number is 1800 737 732. If it's an emergency, please don't wait, call triple zero. If you're following this conversation online, you'll find us on Twitter. Our user handle is at Press Club AUST. Everybody, please join me in welcoming Natasha Stop Despoil. Thank you, Sabra. Good afternoon, everyone. It is, as always, a pleasure to be back at the Press Club. Uh, I uh, begin, of course, by acknowledging the traditional owners, uh, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, the custodi custodians of the Canberra region. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and to any other elders from other communities who may be present or listening today. And I thank you, Auntie Anne, for being in the audience. I also acknowledge members of the press, uh, our watch, our Deputy Chair, Dr Phil Lambert, former Director uh, David Morrison, uh, of course the ANU Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, uh, Brian Schmidt, thank you for being here. I acknowledge departmental representatives and members of the diplomatic corps, including His Excellency Isaiah Kabera from uh, Kenya, the Kenyan High Commissioner to Australia, and the Ambassador for Gender Equality, Julianne Guevara. Thank you for being here. First Assistant Secretary for uh, Office for Women, Prime Minister and um, Prime Minister and Cabinet, Catherine Hawkins, uh, and uh, First Assistant Secretary Acting. Deputy uh, from the Department of Agriculture, Dr Melissa McEwen. Also, Elizabeth Lee, welcome today. I also want to do, as I always do, acknowledge those of you who work every day to keep women and children safe. As Sabra said, I'm speaking to you today in my capacity as the chair, the founding chair of Our Watch, uh, a national organisation which is a leader in primary prevention of violence, uh, preventing violence against women and children in Australia. Chairing our watch has been one of the great privileges of my life, but it also means that every day I'm conscious of one of the most heinous manifestations of gender inequality, and that's violence against women. In the midst of a global pandemic, discussing this ongoing scourge is more important than ever. As we tackle the COVID crisis, we cannot forget what UN women have called the shadow pandemic, that's violence against women and children. And while aspects of Australia's approach to prevention has led to some encouraging signs of progress, we can't be complacent. I'm going to talk a bit about this violence, some of its drivers, and some of the things that we can do in our individual lives and as a society to create uh, a new normal, one in which men, women, boys and girls enjoy ethical, healthy, equal, respectful relationships. Today is actually World Humanitarian Day, so every August 19 we have an opportunity to honour the work of humanitarians, those aid workers who risk their lives in humanitarian settings. Many of those are women. In fact, they make up a lot uh, of the people who save our lives, particularly in our region. They're the first to respond often and often the last to leave. <laughs> 
and they're needed more than ever to strengthen the global uh, humanitarian response. And world leaders and non-state actors should all ensure, in fact, they should work hard to guarantee that these humanitarians are given the protections afforded to them under international law. But of course, at this time, we are dealing with a global crisis, a pandemic, the impact of which is being felt so severely by so many. My thoughts today are with our fellow Australians who have lost loved ones or who are suffering, especially in Victoria, and of course to those in our region and across the global community. But COVID is actually affecting men and women differently. This pandemic has made existing inequalities for women and girls, as well as discrimination against other marginalised groups, including those with a disability or those living in extreme poverty, worse. It's highlighted and exacerbated inequalities in the home and in the workforce, as women to tend to make up a majority of those who are homeschooling, their carers, uh, their healthcare workers uh, and home teachers. Rupert Dutt from Women in Global Health describes women as the shock absorbers of this pandemic because of some of the disproportionate and specific social and economic effects. But one of the most disturbing consequences of this pandemic is the increase in women's experience of violence. This includes different forms of violence, including family and domestic violence, sexual harassment, institutionalised violence and neglect, racist abuse and workplace abuse, image-based abuse. You know, in Australia, one report has shown a 210% increase uh, in online abuse. So so-called revenge porn has skyrocketed. Do you know on the Easter weekend alone, there was a 600% increase in reports of online abuse. Anita Bhatia, who is uh, the Deputy Executive of UN Women, says the very technique we are using to protect people from the virus can perversely impact victims of domestic violence. So we know what this means. It means that victims, usually women and children, can be trapped in their homes, often full time with their abusers. And this also means limited access to opportunities to get help. Now, while earlier on it was difficult to get an overall picture of the extent to which women and children were experiencing increased violence and coercive behaviour in Australia during the pandemic, some clear findings have started to emerge. They show there's been more violence in more Australian homes. The severity of violence has increased and COVID is actually being weaponised within the home as a tool of abuse. A survey of frontline domestic workers undertaken by Monash University in April found that domestic violence had sparked, uh, spiked since the start of the pandemic. More than half of the workers surveyed in Victoria reported an increase in frequency and severity of this violence. 59% said that COVID had increased the frequency of violence against women, including 42% stating an increase in first-time family violence. These uh, results have been mirrored across the country, but in Queensland, for example, there was a 70% recording of practitioners seeing an escalation in the violence experienced by women in May. They also reported cases where men were using the virus to threaten and coerce women. In my home state of South Australia, domestic violence services have recorded an increase in contacts, up to 50%, and a need for placements in emergency accommodation have increased by 66% compared to this time last year. Here in Canberra, services reported a 130% increase in new family violence matters in June compared to the same time last year. Meanwhile, a survey by the Institute of Criminology in Australia of 15,000 women found that 4.6% of the women who responded to the survey experienced physical or sexual violence from a former or current cohabiting partner in the three months prior to the survey. Two thirds of those women said the violence had started or escalated in that period. And ladies and gentlemen, only this weekend we've heard reports, increased reports of financial abuse, including people who are experiencing this abuse for the first time. Domestic Violence Victoria CEO Alison MacDonald said the pandemic's actually been used to justify controlling behaviours, such as limiting access to money, controlling someone's ability to acquire or use money, or making threats about the family's economic stability. So ladies and gentlemen, there's no doubt 
that stress-related factors in this pandemic, in this current situation, including financial pressures, potential family disruption, social isolation, disruption to people's usual personal and social roles, that can compound and exacerbate the underlying conditions that lead to violence against women. So while these stress factors can increase the severity and frequency of violence, they do not in themselves cause it. And they certainly don't excuse it. As our watch says in our campaign, there is no excuse for abuse. But before COVID, Australia already had a problem with what the World Health Organisation calls an epidemic. As Sabra said, when I was here at the Press Club in 2013 with the former Chief Commissioner of Victoria Police, Ken Lay, I described it as a national emergency. And it still is. Police in this country deal with a domestic family uh, violence incident 657 times a day. That's nearly every two minutes. Every week in this country, a woman dies violently. You know, we're up to the 34th week of this year, and 34 women have been murdered. You know, every time I talk about this issue, I have to adjust the statistics. This is shocking. All violence is wrong, of course, no matter who experiences it or who perpetrates it. And of course, not all men are violent, and women are not only the victims of domestic violence. Yet, the data shows really clearly that men and women experience violence differently in both severity and impact. About 95% of all victims of violence in Australia, whether women or men, experience violence from a male perpetrator. Women usually know or experience this violence um, from someone that they do know, often in their homes, sometimes repeatedly, sometimes over a lifetime. Whereas men usually, typically, experience violence at the hands of a stranger. Of the women who experience this violence, more than half have children in their care. Violence is perpetrated against women of all backgrounds, including young and old, women of colour, transgender women and women with a disability. But the rates of violence against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women in this country are Australia's national shame. Three in five Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women have experienced physical or sexual violence by a male intimate partner. They are 11 times more likely to die as a consequence of assault. Ending violence against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women must be a national priority. More importantly, we must listen to First Nations women and communities when they tell us what the best solutions are, and we must support and resource those culturally safe community-led solutions. And we cannot afford to ignore the compounding effect that racism and gender inequality have, exacerbating, uh, have in exacerbating the levels of that violence. We know that women who are migrant women or refugee women are disproportionately affected by this violence as well. As the Harmony Alliance has shown, during COVID, some of these women, especially those on temporary visas, have faced additional barriers to seeking support. And only yesterday we were hearing about the particular impacts of COVID on women with a disability. Women with disabilities experience the same forms of gender-based violence as other women, but they also experience various additional disability-specific forms of violence. Despite this, the voices of women with disabilities are too often excluded from policy data collection approaches, community discussions and responses to violence. This was Sue Salthouse's potent message, and many of you I know will have known her as the ACT Senior Australian of the Year. I know that her death last month has affected many of us. She was a much loved and much admired Our Watch ambassador, and her legacy is a fine one, and I promise you we will honour it with our work. I highlight these facts to give you an idea of the dynamics of violence against different women and the breadth of uh, this violence and its impact on our diverse population. But, you know, the single biggest risk factor for being a victim of family violence, domestic violence or sexual assault in Australia, being female. As Rosie Batty always reminds us, she says, family violence happens to everybody, no matter how house nice your house is or how intelligent you are. 
and she's done more than most in contemporary times to ensure that this is a policy priority issue. The reality is, I suspect, this is why there was such a visceral reaction to the horrific murder of Hannah Clark and her three children six months ago today. And thank you, Sabra, for acknowledging that. Uh, our thoughts are with her friends, her family, her loved ones on this day. But people in Australia seem particularly shocked by this brutal incident, partly because it occurred on a school run in a leafy Brisbane suburb with this sort of seemingly picture-perfect family. This shocking case teaches us a lot about domestic violence. For whatever our perceptions, family violence does not occur in a vacuum. Perpetrators don't simply snap and kill their loved ones and their families. As in the Clark case, murder is usually the tragic end after a long history of fear, control and abuse. We know that some men are recognising these patterns of behaviour in themselves. So we've actually seen during this COVID period an increase in men reaching out to Men's Line and other helplines, saying no to violence, to talk about their behaviour. And we also know that even though these murders make the headlines, and they should, so much of the violence that women experience on a daily basis in this country is invisible. And it's not always helpful to think of violence against women as some kind of shocking anomaly perpetuated by dangerous men, or as Tom Ma, the husband of late Jill Ma, um, so eloquently says, the monster myth. We know now there's actually a broad spectrum of violence which takes many forms. Some of it physical, some of it sexual, some of it psychological and coercive and controlling behaviour. It includes relationship violence and other forms of family violence as well as violence in the streets and in public places and indeed workplace sexual harassment. We need to think beyond the individual level. Violence emerges in a broader social construct. This is a society where the underlying conditions of gender inequality mean that violence against women is often condoned, trivialised, maybe considered a private matter, where sexism or boys being boys is excused, and where there's an assumption that men are or should be in control. So if we want to stop this violence, we need to think about it as a social problem, where the solution is social change and that's where prevention comes in. Even with the outpouring of community grief and anger about Hannah Clark's murder and the murder of her children, within a few days, another Brisbane woman, Jacqueline Joy Sturgis, was killed by her husband only a few suburbs away with a sledgehammer. He then went to the pub to buy alcohol. They have three, they had two daughters, similar ages to my children. How can we not be haunted by this violence, Australia? I know that many of you are sickened by these stories, the statistics, the body count, the slaughter in our suburbs, and I know we can't go on like this. So does this awful crisis bring an opportunity for change? I hope so, I believe it does. Although there's no single cause of violence against women, research shows us that the main drivers are the condoning of tr or trivialisation of violence against women, men's control or limits on women's independence, adherence to rigid gender roles and disrespect towards women. There is a common misconception that drugs or alcohol, mental health or poverty are to blame for this violence. But the evidence says that while these factors can compound or intensify this violence, taking drugs or alcohol or being poor doesn't cause this. We know the best way to end this violence is to stop it from happening in the first place. This is primary prevention and it happens in all the places that we live, love, learn, work and play. And the job of primary prevention is not the responsibility of, say, a small number of highly qualified counsellors or law enforcement specialists. It's everyone's role. It requires government policy, corporate responsibility, organisational structures and community action. And we've actually been a world leader. Australia's been a world leader in these primary prevention processes, be it with smoking or uh, safe driving uh, or sun safety. So we know that popula population-wide change is actually possible. And we've seen progress. In the last decade, we've seen all governments of all persuasions sign on 
you know, to a national plan to reduce violence against women and their children, of which prevention is a prominent element. Along with the provision of critical early intervention and response services, and they are critical right now especially, there is an increasing recognition of the need to explicitly address the drivers of this violence and to promote gender equality. That's why governments have adopted campaigns like Stop It at the Start. And we've seen progress. The National Community Attitude Survey shows there's a reduction in the proportion of Australians whose attitudes condone or accept violence against women. There's been an improvement in the attitude towards women's engagement in public life, with increased support for broadening of the kinds of roles available to women and greater acceptance of women's full participation in the workforce. But we can't afford to lose these gains as a consequence of the pandemic. It's particularly important when it comes to the messages that we're sending young people. Evidence shows that to prevent violence against women, we need to reach young people. And we've got to reach them when they're having either their first romantic relationship or they're starting to think about it. It's this formative time that can have a particularly strong influence um, and create opportunities for young people to form positive attitudes and behaviours that continue to be held throughout their lives. Children and young people can be agents of change when transforming the attitudes, norms and practices that drive violence against women in this country. And it's promising that young people actually have a higher level of support for women's independence and decision making in public life. However, there are some concerning attitudes. Young men are actually more likely to endorse men's control over decision making in private life than women with young men more than likely, more than twice as likely as young women to agree that men should take control in relationships. Do you know a fifth of young men believe that domestic violence is a normal reaction to day-to-day -day stress and frustration? So what does that tell us about how vital this particular period is? Symbolism matters. Young people need to see diverse and constructive role models, such as strong and respected and high-profile women and men that don't necessarily sort of fit that traditional hyper-masculine stereotype. Sportsmen and women have a huge influence, of course, which is why our watch is proud to work with ambassadors like Ben Brown and Taylor Harris. Ben actually says, gender equality is not about pitting men against women. Equality and inclusion will not come at the expense of anyone. We all benefit from an equal and inclusive society. This is why it's so important to engage men and boys in this particular debate as well, whether it's in workplaces or schools or sporting clubs. I see Moya Dodd, former Matilda in the audience. We've just worked on the successful Women's World Cup 2023. And you know, I can't underestimate what impact that has, not just on the participation of women in sport generally and girls, but the message it will send about gender equality. And I don't deny the influence of popular culture, especially at a time when we're probably watching a bit too much Ivu uh, or Netflix. Um, but when, you know, Bachelor in Paradise TV reality star Kieran Stott, no relation, says, if you want to date my ex, you've got to ask me as some kind of perverse bro code. You can't underestimate the potential message that sends to young people and risks endorsing outdated stereotypes. We know young people, though, they still rely on family members as their main source of role modelling. So if we practice and model healthy, respectful relationships, that sends a message. And as parents and carers, there are things that we can do to show equality and respect. Men and women share the housekeeping, the caregiving, don't treat children differently based on their sex or their gender. Language matters. Be wary of excusing bad behaviour by saying boys will be boys. Or using pejorative terms or meaning pejorative way. You know, run like a girl. Don't describe or compliment girls only in terms of their looks. For many of us, COVID has meant more time at home, whether it's juggling homeschooling or work, and it brings opportunities as well as challenges, and I don't underestimate how stressful it can be. There are burdens on our workplaces too, but we really need our workplaces to create flexible work opportunities and arrangements for men and women. In addition, they should be updating and initiating policies such as those to do with domestic 
violence leave, for example. And businesses rebuilding from the economic impact of COVID should consider updating policies or implementing practices that embed gender equality from the top down. You can't talk about these issues or diversity generally with a board of directors that is homogeneous. And we can all be good bystanders, call out bad behaviour. You know, as the, you know, David Morrison reminds us, the standard you walk by. But it does matter. And if you feel uncomfortable about calling out, uh, out inappropriate behaviour or a sexist joke, you're not alone. More than three quarters of us say that we'd like to do that, but we don't feel that our friends would back us up. Don't make assumptions about ability based on gender. I know it might be a little laughable when my husband Ian says, you know, I serve a survey sample of two, that men stack a dishwasher better than women. Thank you, Tim Shaw. But, yeah, it doesn't exactly pass the evidence test. But, but then it's a little more serious when people believe that men naturally make better leaders because they are more rational or less emotional than women. That is a view held by one-fifth of Australians. Needless to say, my parliamentary career doesn't necessarily support that conclusion. And speaking of politics, you know, it's, for me, almost 25 years since I first set foot or dock in the federal parliament. And I didn't under, I just didn't anticipate that we wouldn't have reached gender parity by now. And I know that the Senate has. And I've always known that the real action was in the red leather benches, but it, we have still a long way to go. Apart from being the right thing to do, the fair thing to do, we know that an increased number of women in positions of power has a positive effect, right down to measures as simple as profit and loss. And we also know there is a proven connection between women in power and efforts to address violence against women and children. It's true, we can't be what we can't see. And when I was a senator for the first time, most of the letters, not emails, but letters then that I got were from young people saying, if she can do it, so can I. Yet we still confront outdated stereotypes, double standards in the media, debates about marital status, parental status, appearance when it comes to women's suitability for politics. I didn't think that I'd be looking at a female MP donning a garbage bag in order to make a point about ridiculous stereotypes in this day and age. And you know, it was per pervasive in my day too, Sabra. From the first day I walked into Parliament, you know, and a journalist wrote about my cheap purple suit. I always like to say that on that day the devil wore Portman's, not Prada. <laughs> I digress. Ladies and gentlemen, our national response to and recovery from the pandemic can strengthen women's economic security, our independence, our economic participation and decision making in public life, all of which are measures that will actually help reduce violence against women. For example, we can promote gender equality through economic stimulus measures. We can increase value placed on women's unpaid domestic labour and care through public policy measures. We can develop strategies to value and fairly remunerate those who are working in female-dominated industries. And we can consider economic and social measures, such as universal childcare and early education. And should we really be talking about reductions in COVID supplement payments to women and children who are escaping domestic violence. And of course, we must continue to resource, provide resources for reforms to address violence against women through prevention and response. But critical to bringing this to life is hearing women's voices and considering the impact of the crisis on their lives. This pandemic, what impact has it had on women's lives? And we need to do that by applying a gender lens and an analysis to policy and budget decisions. Ladies and gentlemen, I actually think Australians want change. While the issue of violence against women and children is a complex one, at its heart is also simple. To change the story that ends in violence against women, we must begin with gender equality and respect for all. How we treat men and women in our society and the messages we send boys and girls from the moment that they are born 
all play a role in shaping a violence-free future. So, the good news? Violence against women and children is preventable. I hope that you will all be part of the mission to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you very much for your speech. Thank you very much for your speech. Before we start with questions, I just want to read out that number one more time in case um, people need it, especially those at home. 1800 RESPECT, that's 1800 737 732. Interesting, when you talk about run like a girl, I think kick like a girl now, and I think of Taylor Harris. Yes. And I also think of Occasionally, when I see and hear things, I do think of David Morrison, your statement, the standard that you walk past is the standard you accept. So thank you very much for making that part of Australian culture. On your point about uh, uh, women struggling to find shelter, we know that during the COVID pandemic, homelessness is, is, it has been a problem that state governments have solved temporarily. They've housed a lot of people who have been living on the streets, they've found temporary accommodation for them. So that, in your view, is this a problem that can be easily solved? And for way too long, governments have simply ducked finding proper solutions for it. Obviously, one of the single biggest reasons for homelessness um, among women and children in this country is domestic and family violence. So we know that that is an absolute causal factor. And we know that obviously there is a lack of, whether that's shelter accommodation or um, you know, social housing and affordable housing. Yes, we've seen in the pandemic, we've actually seen not only rapid response to some of those issues, proving yes, it can be done. And a lot more can be done with resources, but obviously I've got to keep reminding that there's that early intervention response provision of services, which is absolutely a priority. And that can be done with varying degrees of alacrity. And yes, more should be done. And then there's the cultural change prevention side, which will take longer. But we've actually seen an urgency given to some of the issues many of us have talked about, many of you in this room have talked about for many years. And whether that's you know, affordable housing, look at Richard Dennis over there, or whether it's dealing with universal childcare. I mean, essential. Did we need to understand how essential childcare was to women and men in this nation? Well, of course we knew it was, but how quickly it could be deemed an essential service and how we've learnt from that. So this is an opportunity before even looking at the idea of implementing free childcare or early education, there are a range of options governments could explore, remunerating better that pri predominantly female workforce that works in the childcare industry understanding that we have to better value those feminised industries that have been so crucial in this pandemic in terms of how we respond to it, and yet are typically underpaid, underskilled, undervalued in the eyes of so many. Katina Curtis. Thanks. Katina Curtis from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Thank you for your speech. Thank you. Um, I was interested that you talked about the, the increase in um, Con control via financial means through through the pandemic, and I guess uh, what what we've seen the effect that the pandemic has had economically on on women disproportionately, and how how you see I guess some concrete measures for the economic stimulus that could help with gender parity, and how that might address give perhaps give women the financial means to escape that control that they're finding. Thank you. I think uh, the huge economic and disproportionate impact on women has both immediate and concerning consequences as well as the long-term ones. So when you look at the industries, yes, that have been hit hardest, you know, the reduction in opportunities for women in terms of employment and income, so huge impact in the short term, but that combined with, you know, likely global recession has ongoing implications for women workplace opportunities. And we know that that idea of economic security, financial autonomy has a absolute implications for women not only potentially experiencing violence, but obviously 
being liberated from or escaping such violence. And you've seen the statistics, you know them as well as I do, and particularly when it comes to, you know, in Victoria currently, when you're seeing, you know, the highest proportion of people living in pension of poverty, they're women. You look at the statistics in relation to job losses uh, across the nation, but again, uh, in Victoria at this particular time of urgency, what, four times the rate of men losing jobs. And you look at what I alluded to briefly, the idea of the um, coronavirus supplement, uh, which I believe is due to finish in September for some of those women and families who are the victims of and escaping family violence. So you've got so many levers, you know, I think was uh, Tanya Kovic who referred to the sort of shovel-ready stimulus. Well, of course, infrastructure and a range of other things are important in order to get this country back on its feet. But gender lens, are we looking at the industries that have been hit hardest? Are we looking at those feminised or female-dominated sectors that have proved so valuable to dealing with this pandemic and yet are not being supported? The idea that childcare workers would be among the first to lose JobKeeper these issues surely are you know, the subject of what should be a discussion that recognises that gender is absolutely pivotal. So yes, we can, go, we can reimagine, we can actually use this as an opportunity for a transformative agenda when it comes to our economy and society. We can look at those sectors and industries in which women are um, dominant and actually work out how we can better value them better recognise them and certainly better remunerate them. And I think that's actually not just a broader vision that will play a role in you know, the economic stimulus that our country will no doubt need. Olivia Casely. Olivia Casely from The Australian, also a fan of purple suits. Thanks very much for your speech. Um, at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, Scott Morrison announced that $150 million would go towards supporting those experiencing domestic, sexual and family violence. Do you think enough is being done to address some of the alarming statistics you've raised today, especially considering $68 million of this package is yet to be spent? Thank you for that and uh, nice seat. Uh, look, that was a really good early contribution by the Commonwealth Government. It showed that there was a relatively early recognition uh, in this pandemic that women and children would be disproportionately affected, but also that the issue of violence, based on what we were seeing regionally and globally, that this was going to spike. That money appropriately went to, obviously, an advertisement and a campaign to show people where to get support, but at the same time also money was going to uh, Men's Line and other referral services, a recognition that men are a really important part of this equation in terms of perpetrators who are at risk or concerned about their own patterns of behaviour, but also that money went into states and territories to ensure the kind of emergency or response uh, support was provided. Has it been enough? Well, let's ask the frontline workers on the ground. Uh, they're saying that there is still huge need. So the other part of your question relates to the timing uh, and the release of that package, and I think that is part of the problem that's been identified, that there is money there, uh, but the pace and the rate at which that money is being provided is, as I understand, a problem. But it's the frontline workers who are dealing with these issues day in, day out. They're the voices that we must listen to, and they are telling us they need more support. But again, this is an immediate issue in relation to the pandemic and violence generally, but it's also long term. And the next stage of the planning process for us as a country is the next national plan. And there are opportunities to do things better, but we must never forget that urgent response, early intervention side, and prevention. And we've got to start thinking too, there are ways to engage all governments, all jurisdictions, all political persuasions with the experts. And the experts know what we need, and they're telling us they need more. Nor Haydar. Nor Hader from the ABC. Thanks, Natasha, for your speech. Um, primary prevention is no doubt crucial in addressing domestic violence, but over recent years there's been more debate about the merits of criminalising coercive control. Do you think that's something that states and territories should do? And do you think this pandemic will make governments more bold in their reforms? That's a good question and particularly um, poignant on the day that we acknowledge the anniversary of Hannah Clark's murder. I understand that her parents have called for coercive control uh, to be um, in policy and legislated for 
I think they perhaps provide the most <coughs> compelling case for why we should be considering coercive control in law. I don't underestimate the difficulties in legislating this issue, and there have been reports and examinations, including by the Australian Law Reform Commission in 2010, that actually recommended against this. And I think that there are concerns about definitional issues to do with coercive control. People have argued, what is the line between you know, unpleasant behaviour and what is psychological abuse? These are difficult, complex issues, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't be grappling with it. You see that coercive control, which is psychological abuse, is evident in most, certainly according to reports, most um, homicides involving domestic um, or intimate partner disputes. And therefore, surely this has to be considered as one of the um, policy reforms. Again, I don't underestimate the difficulties in terms of definition and also the fact that coercive control, if, is, if it was uh, legislated in that way, can actually be used against victims. But we now have world-leading legislation in Scotland that can help us lead the way with their Domestic Abuse Act. So it's time. I think it's time to have these discussions. 2010's a long time ago. Um, you know, even in 2010, a lot of the work that we were doing on primary prevention was nascent. You know, we've now got a whole evidence base that can tell us how we could try and enshrine this in law. And we should be working with family law experts because, again, they're the ones that understand this. But certainly, um, if you look at homicide cases, 99% of those homicide cases involving family violence have psychological abuse and coercive control involved. So it's time, and I think that the Clark family have given us impetus to re-examine this issue now. Following uh, Hannah Clark's death, it prompted one federal MP to think about what, what could he do. He's put forward a private member's bill to the federal parliament on the issue of the rebuttable presumption of 50% 50, 50 custody in, in cases of contested um, uh, custody cases. Um, this comes also as the um, Chief Justice of the Family Court last week said that there'd been a 200 per cent increase in urgent cases before the Family Court and I think 70 per cent increase in the uh, Federal Circuit Court. What Do you have a view about that particular law as it exists and whether, it's, um, you know, whether it is time to do a away with that automatic assumption? Well, Sabra, you could check out my voting record. Um, I've voted against it. Um, was one of the most depressing legislative and parliamentary debates of my life. It taught me a lesson about process. Don't give, you know, one government control of the upper house. Uh, and secondly, about policy. This policy was not nuanced. It wasn't empathetic. It wasn't based on evidence. It wasn't well researched. And it broke my heart. Uh, as someone who dealt with the family court as a legislator and as a seven-year-old, I understand that it's a flawed system. I understand it's hard to get it right, but that was a classic example of bad legislation. I would strongly um, recommend legislators not only to look at private members' bills, but to do this on a cross-party basis. And instead of going back to parliamentary inquiries, as much as I enjoyed them in my time, there is an evidence base out there. There is a family, there's an Australian Law Reform Commission report. There's the Women's Legal Services submission that points out some of the five key areas of reform in family court that will help with issues of intervention and dealing with family violence. So yes, you need broad ranging reform in this area and I'm not suggesting it's easy to get it right, but I think there have been some really fundamental mistakes that have taken us backwards. But the evidence base is there now, so there's no excuse for legislators not to recognise this and to recognise it within a context, not just of individual acts of violence, but broader understanding as to what drives violence against women and children in our society. Annabel Hennessy. Um, thank you so much for your sobering speech. Um, the federal government has recently been speaking about allowing victims of domestic violence early access to superannuation. 
given we know that women are already retiring with less super than men and we have a growing cohort of older women becoming homeless, is it fair to make victims of domestic violence access their super early when they themselves have not committed a crime? No, it's not fair. Uh, I think broadly we talk about the drivers of violence and we know that the drivers of violence against women uh, lie, you know, the, as are, are as a consequence of persistent discrimination against women in society. So what makes up some of that discrimination? Well, women fare worse than men on so many counts in our society, whether that's in relation to unpaid caring roles, whether it's job security and opportunities, uh, whether it's the pay gap or indeed retiring with less super anyway. So then when you introduce measures to do with early access to or you know, your super, whether it's in a pandemic or more generally, let's look at the recent statistics. What are they telling us right now when it comes to young people, young men and young women who've taken advantage during this pandemic to access their super? What are men, young men, spending it on? tend to be discretionary items, according to some of the research. And I can't drill down. I know there will be a lot more information that you know, comes to hand as we can get to see who's accessing their super and for what purposes. Women, though, younger women apparently are using it for absolute essentials, for fundamentals, including rent and other supplies. So I get concerned when groups that are already disproportionately affected for economic and social reasons, utilising super, not because I don't want them to have some you know, ease of access or freedom to um, you know, discretion to use their super, but what it means in the medium to long term for those families, it makes me very concerned. There's got to be a better way than that. Daniel Hurst. Hello, Daniel Hurst from Guardian Australia. Um, you're, just to take you to a slightly different matter, um, you're Australia's candidate for the UN uh, Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Could you give us a bit of an update about where you're at with um, reaching out to um, other countries in seeking support for that role and what priorities you think you could bring to that? Um, you know, where, what lessons can Australia bring to the international discussion about, about tackling these problems? Thank you. Um, you could probably guess some of my priorities based on uh, uh, the content of my speech, um, but uh, feel free to elaborate. Uh, you never say that to a former politician, mate. Right? Um, uh, more serious lo seriously, though, I'm, I'm really honoured to be Australia's candidate for uh, the Committee on uh, the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, which is responsible for uh, the Convention uh, on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. It's been almost 30 years since Australia fielded a candidate, and I'm really honoured that uh, the government and Maurice Payne uh, supported me as the Australian candidate, although I would serve in an independent capacity. Uh, there are a lot of supportive people in the room, but I want to acknowledge uh, Sally Moyle, who was really one of the leaders of civil society in helping to convince governments uh, that we should actually run a candidate for, um, for this role. In terms of where we're up to, um, there was an election due on the 29th of June this year at the UN in New York. For obvious reasons, that hasn't taken place. So it's been postponed. Um, yes, I've never been in a postponed election before, so it's a new experience for me. Um, so I'm hoping that there'll be an election sometime this year, but understandably there are other issues with which the UN is, uh, is dealing. In terms of policy priorities, I think Australia's been world leading in some of its responses um, and it, to family violence, but also some of its work in primary prevention. You know, one of the first countries in the world to establish a national framework for the prevention of violence against women. That is some of the work I'd like to take on behalf of my country and the region uh, as the only Oceania uh, candidate um, to, uh, to CEDAW. I hope that I'll be fortunate, but I'm running against 19 candidates. But hey, the Senate, I've run against more than that, so <laughs> we'll see how we go. But certainly um, the prevention of violence against women and children, uh, issues such as gender pay gap, women's economic uh, empowerment, of course, and the issue dear to my heart, women in leadership, women in politics, women in decision making. You know, uh, I see Caitlin here from Girls Take Over Parliament today, and I get very excited about the prospect of uh, young women and girls in our region and around the world aspiring to be leaders. And you look at that research that's out today, I think it's in Forbes, uh, you know, an international survey that's looked at countries and how they've managed the COVID pandemic and those with female leaders. It's actually been considered a marker for success, for lack of a better word. And I don't want to be someone making assumptions based on gender now, but 
certainly more diversity, women and men having equal access to positions of power, um, that all makes for healthier, happier markets in countries. So I'd be honoured to serve, but uh, we'll wait and see how uh, roughly 187 countries vote. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you for the question. Mr Schubert. Uh, Misha Schubert is a director of the National Press Club. Um, should I also disclose that we've known each other since we were 18, well, since I was 18, and I want to say thank you, Natasha, for your speech today, but also um, for a lifetime of leadership and advocacy on these really important issues. Um, I, one of the things that I often think about when I see those stories like Anna Clark's and others, so many, too many like them, uh, is that tension between the long-run work that's really important around shifting unacceptable attitudes and a lack of um, you know, universal uh, acceptance around equality and respect and the work at the acute end to step in for us to respond in that moment when a woman and her children are at immediate risk. Can you share some thoughts on how you process and juggle that experience in that moment? and? what more we could and should be doing at the acute end, um, as well as this really important foundational long-run work that's, uh, that's the sort of longer-term answer to that. Thanks, Mish. Um, good to see you and thank you for your kind words. I think today I've tried at best to emphasise the need for resources, including additional resources, at that front end, that end of acute response and early intervention, because those issues are not going away, as we've seen with Hannah Clark's murder and the murder of 33 other women this year and around 38 children. Uh, so there's no denying that this is still a national emergency requiring resources, requiring support, and some of its, some of its system change in terms of the family court. There is a gap between uh, family and child protection services and the law. There are gaps and these don't always require resources but they require goodwill and they require political will. So there are things that can be done as well as on a, almost an individual basis in terms of acute care and support. And I think Sabra reminding us of 1800 Respect today and the fact that if you are concerned about someone or your own life or safety, triple zero immediately. And then you're right, there is the longer term change. You know what, I thought policy and legislative change took a long time, but cultural change can take generations. And don't take that as complacency. I've heard people say, oh, Natasha, you know, you can't be this complacent. Complacent, I am impatient. I didn't think I'd be talking about the same issues at 50 that my mum was writing about as a journalist 40 years ago. So I just want to be a realist in the sense that I know how we can speed this process up, but we have to all commit to it. So cultural change does take time. So when I talk about those young people in the statistics, it's really a problem that young boys really think that not only is consent maybe not required in some circumstances, or that if you dress up a certain way you're asking for it, or indeed, as I said, fifth of them thinking that Domestic violence is a natural response to day-to-day -day stress. We've actually got some really serious ideas, stereotypes and behaviours to unpack here, and that will take time. But if we all start to do it, asking about friends who we're concerned about, but at the other end, making sure our schools have respectful relationships education, our workplaces embed gender equality, not just in terms of, you know, what are the posters in the tea room, right through to who's running the board. We make sure that our sporting codes not only have lockers for women or a code about, you know, conduct, but they actually exemplify that behaviour on the field or in the locker room, as the case was two weeks ago. All of these areas where we live, love, learn, work and play, all of these enable us to contribute to this change. And yeah, it's long term, it's not happening fast enough, but hopefully some of the messages from this year, from this pandemic, from the awful, critical, tragic event that happened to Hannah Clark and her children, surely that spurs us on, doesn't it? Doesn't it? I hope so. Thank you.
I just want to point out, I can see that you've got a proud family watching uh, on in South Australia, and I also want to thank you because um, we are operating under COVID-19 restrictions today. I forgot to mention that at the start of the broadcast, and I know because you are here today, when you go back home, you will be going into quarantine for a fortnight, so I do thank you for making that commitment. Our next question, Virginia Hausiger. Hello, Natasha. Virginia Halsiger, um, Chair of the 5050 by 2030 Foundation at the University of Canberra. Thank you. I want to thank you also, but thank you for that wonderful, wonderful speech. I hope the transcript of your speech is made mandatory reading for all parliamentarians across every state and ter territory, and of course federally, as well as mandatory reading for young boys and girls in their senior levels at school. There are many, many, many things I want to ask you, but uh, I'll keep it to one. You mentioned um, economic stimulus measures, and as you've also said throughout today, the issue uh, all comes back to around violence and the obstacles and barriers to women's progress comes back to gender equality, and it's something we've done a great deal of research on ourselves at the 5050 Foundation. But at core, we know that policy is key, and uh, you mentioned gender-responsive budgeting. This is something that we've been talking a great deal around. In fact, there are many, many women in this room right now who've been writing submissions to Parliament on this very issue. We have a budget coming up. As a former parliamentarian, do you see the possibility of gender-responsive budgeting being introduced to Australia soon, and possibly even going as far as something as GBA+, Plus, which our Canadian friends do? As we know, the uh, Canadians have a gender-biased um, gender analysis plus uh, um, format that they put all policy under before it actually becomes legislation. Mm. Do you think these are things that Australia can actually introduce and should introduce, and if so, when? Thanks, Virginia. Canada's also got a feminist foreign policy, so, you know, you never know. Look, um, I think it's entirely realistic to consider gender responsive budgeting. I'm not, I don't have an insight these days, just quietly, so I don't know what's on the table. But I do know that we've, um, I know that the application of a gender lens is something that does happen. I know that there are many people in government, uh, in bureaucracy, uh, even in, you know, in, in parliament who th consider this uh, appropriate. And it's, you don't even have to produce a women's budget per se, as, you know, may have been the beginning of my time in parliament. There are cleverer, nuanced ways that we can now analyse the policies that we implement in any area, you know, economic and more broadly, as we would say, to ensure that you can assess its impact on women. You know, is it a good impact or a bad impact? In fact, I think a gender lens serves us all well, doesn't it, about ensuring that everyone benefits. So I do think that is a possibility. I think that a lot of good work and research has been done on it. But, you know, at this stage, I'm almost settled for just knowing that people are viewing that budget from that perspective, that there is someone and people in there saying, and I know there are good people, I know in Office for Women and elsewhere, this is a mandate, checking out what is the impact on women. But it's going to take a while for that sense of, yes, at the policy level, but more broadly, some of the you know, members of parliament to understand why this is beneficial, why it's economically productive for all of us, why we all benefit. So I'm hoping, but I don't know, maybe I'm being naive. I just think that uh, it serves our community well whether or not uh, you are male or female, to have a budget that addresses some of these issues. And just think of the impact on GDP, not just in terms of you know, economic impact, you know, the amount of dollars we save or spend, what we invest in women's industries, but women's workforce participation. We know all of that adds to our bottom line. Why wouldn't we be doing it? Throw forward to November, um, the Democratic Party has just formally nominated Joe, Joe Biden for president. If he is successful, that means that the 2IC will be a woman. What change do you think that will bring? Well, symbolism and substance. The symbolism can never be underestimated. So seeing different faces reflected and represented, but a woman of colour, Vice President of the United States, that sends arguably the most potent message uh, about leadership, certainly in that part of the world, uh, historically. Gosh, imagine how hard it was for Geraldine Ferraro when you look back now. What was she doing all those years ago for her to be a VP candidate? Uh, but no, Kamala Harris, uh, apart from her substance, uh, 
uh, and her you know, policy strength, whether you agree with her or not, it sends a message. And yes, it does send a message to young women, including girls of colour, that this is something to which they not only can aspire, but they have a right. But certainly I hope that the impact of her election, and again, hopefully more women in the Congress, will have an impact on policy. And so you need, you need both. But uh, certainly we can't be what we can't see. And that makes such a difference to, uh, to young women aspiring to be in leadership positions. And we know the research is so clear that women in positions of power has an impact on young people, young girls' considerations, particularly in developing countries, but it makes them more likely to be engaged in leadership roles themselves, particularly in areas like conflict prevention. So it's a win-win. I can't wait to see how the narrative evolves around her candidacy. So, because I suspect she's going to deal with some extraordinary comments and stereotypes. Tim Shaw. Uh, Tim Shaw, director of the National Tim. Press Club. Natasha, welcome back. Uh, to the club. In 2015, a report was written, a high price to pay, the economic case for preventing violence against women and children. Uh, it was written by PwC and it's on your Our Watch website. It says the $22 billion cost annually in relation to uh, domestic violence, two thirds of which is borne by the victim. On Monday, Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews announced another 1,500 places, a cost of about $20 million, to remove perpetrators and men at risk of potentially perpetrating. Is this the answer? Your partners are governments right across the nation. It's the safest thing for women and children to identify as early on and remove that risk, to be able to have governments funding, as the Andrews government has funded yet another, 1,500 places this week. Your thoughts? Thank you, Tim. I think you'll find that a number of state and territory governments have adopted uh, similar or aspects of um, that policy, not only in their responses to the pandemic, but more broadly. You'll see that there's been a shift in emphasis over decades as to how you treat victims. Do you get victims out of a house or you, do you get perpetrators? And I think the broader discussion around how we manage and hold perpetrators accountable and assist perpetrators in changing their behaviours and attitudes, I think that's a really important next topic for debate and policy work. But certainly... Well, it saves lives. Of course, it saves lives, but the... Uh, this is a very complex topic because, as we know, uh, sometimes the most dangerous time for a woman, for example, with her children, uh, either leaving or separating from uh, an estranged partner, that's often the time at which she is at most risk. But apart from those issues, we do commend that policy that um, Premier Andrews has provided. And again, I do know of all different ideas and policies that have been promoted by and adopted by different governments. But certainly that is something you will have seen over the past few decades, an absolute shift in where, how we deal with perpetrators, how we deal with victims. But you know what? Apart from the social and human imperative of wanting to save lives and strengthen lives and give children you know, the opportunity to live without trauma, abuse, coercion, etc., it's a pretty good incentive, isn't it, to solve violence? $21.7 billion per annum. Think of the things that we could save that money, you save or use with that money that we save. $21.7 billion per annum. That's how much violence against women is costing this country every year. So, yes, thank you for the question, but we commend that policy and we encourage other jurisdictions to look at what was announced this week in Victoria. Gosh, you're not tempted to run for politics again, are you? Run as an independent? <laughs> Astrid Watts. Hi, Natasha. Um, so my question relates to the violence and sexual assault. So you said the change begins with young people. However, it seems to be systematically endemic within the police force that they discourage victims, females, specifically female victims of sexual assault, to resist pressing charges. This was the case when a 16-year-old girl was raped in Victoria. Her perpetrator was 14 years old. The female police officer convinced her not to press charges, stating it would ruin the victim's life. 
How do you feel we can change this? Oh, Astrid, that's a good question, and it's hard to hone in on that specific case, although I know that, broadly speaking, um, the issue of victim blaming in our society is one that often stops uh, victims from coming forward in the first place. Uh, a culture of, of blame, um, but also the way that we then treat victims and perpetrators, uh, you know, particularly in the case of these perpetrators, say man or young man or boy, that sense of it, we view him in terms of, you know, the lost potential for him as opposed to the traumatic um, criminal impact on, you know, the victim's lives. There are a lot of issues to unpack there, and certainly I don't think it's only the police with which we have to deal. There's a role for certainly the media in the room today. You know, you've got a role in this too, reporting ethically and responsibly on the issue of violence against women and gender equality generally, not perpetrating and perpetuating some of the victim blaming and the victim myths that arise, which actually then, you know, seep through our culture and our communities. So there's a lot there, but certainly we all have a role to play, whether it's law enforcement at one end of the spectrum, right through to the education system. And if we're not getting messages, you know, if you get a message in school that's positive or today out of this press club or indeed in your own family, but then it's not reinforced in other areas, systems, it's still one step back. There's still a lot more to do. So thank you for the question. And yes, we have a, a way to go in the way that we deal with victims uh, in our society, um, not only in terms of holding perpetrators accountable, but making sure that there is absolute support and justice. Thank you, Natasha. Thanks, Astrid. Nick Stewart, and we're close to time. Thank you. Absolutely terrific speech, utterly horrific statistics, particularly about the, the situation that women are in since COVID struck. The government, of course, has its National COVID Commission, which we, we are not aware of any of their, their deliberations. How urgent is it that that commission, and the government in particular, takes immediate action, the federal government, takes immediate action to provide some sort of support and assistance to, to women in the community at the moment, particularly under the pressure of COVID? Well, generally speaking, of course there's an obligation for government, indeed everyone, to provide additional and uh, greater support for women, partly because of the disproportionate impact that this crisis, this pandemic, is having on women. There are a number of ways that can be done. We've discussed some of them today, but certainly I believe that there is there are people that are viewing this with a gender lens, and I have to hope that people will adopt a better perspective on some of these issues as we start to realise women at the front line of the crisis, health workers, teachers, childcare workers, they're bearing the brunt in terms of income loss, jobs insecurity, job losses, plus all those other issues to which I referred, violence against women. It is a priority, and I urge governments and everyone to play a role in addressing it. If the government made it a priority of their October budget, how do you think it would be regarded? Well, I think for Australians, understanding the extent to which this crisis has affected women is also... Um, that's needed as well. I don't know if Australians actually quite understand. And quite rightly, a lot of Australians and families and individuals are dealing with the current crisis, the immediate impact. Getting that big picture is sometimes hard. But if governments talk to us about the big picture, then that makes it sometimes a little more understandable. So governments have a responsibility, yes, to lead this conversation and the narrative, just in the same way people out of this room and inside this room have provided the research and the evidence we need to come up with really good solutions that will address or help address what is going to be a difficult time for our country and our people, and I don't underestimate that. All right. Everybody, please join me in thanking <laughs> Chair of our Director, Thank you, and as a thank you on behalf of the club, I'd like to say, please accept the gift of membership here to the National Press Club. It might be a little while since you've had gift membership of the Press Club, but please accept it. Thank you very much. I've just got two weeks of isolation to go, and I'll... <laughs> Super, thank you very much. Thank you.